Bible study at Snow's. Now that is during Awana time, which again, if you have to choose between working at Awana and going to this Bible study, I would, I would say that Mr. Trav needs your help in Awana. But for most of these people, they are not making that choice. We wouldn't see them on Wednesday night if it weren't for the Bible study. So, I encourage you, and that brings me to our existing schedule, 6.30 p.m., Awana, for ages 3 through 12th grade. And that runs until 7.30 for ages 3 through 5th grade, and until 8 p.m. for 6th through 12th grade. Did I get that right, Mr. Trev? Yes. All right. So, we invite you to come out for all of the above or any of the above. All right. Did all of that make sense? All right. If you have questions, talk to Pastor Brent. Or the deacons, or me. All right. Work day this Saturday. 9 a.m. to noon. I am not 100% sure. I know that the workday schedule said something about mounting the projector. I don't know if that is the entire project or if there's some, obviously we have work going on here. This, there may be work going on here as well. But come out Saturday from 9 a.m. to noon. I know that we've had some people that came in around 11.15 or 11.30 to help clean up. If you would like to do that, maybe you're not good with power tools. Maybe you'd like to come in at that time. Though I'll say from my own experience, I'm not good with power tools either. And I'm not good on ladders. And I came to the first work day, and I was holding ladders, and I was hauling garbage, and I kept fairly busy. So come out. We'll find something for you to do. All right. Next Sunday, another new piece of information for you. Next Sunday, we will have a representative from Faith Baptist Bible College in Ankeny, Iowa, here with us. And he will be preaching for all services. He will be teaching combined Sunday school class, telling us about Faith Baptist Bible College, and I encourage you to come out for that. Um, I have never been to Faith, but I've heard a lot about it. I have friends who've gone there, and... Let me just say this. It would be one of three or four schools that I would recommend. So come out next Sunday for that. Men's retreat is, well, that's next week, the end of next week already, March 9th through 11th. I know of at least three men, including myself and Pastor Brent, Rick Maddish, and perhaps there's others that I don't, do, don't know you're going but if you would like to go to that, register with Wolf Mountain on their website, or you can call them. Uh, if you would like to carpool, talk with Pastor Brent, talk with Rick Maddish, and we can figure something out. Baby shower. While the men are away at Wolf Mountain, the women will play. <laughs> Baby shower for Whitney on Saturday, March 11th at 1 p.m. and see Olga Brown for more details and how you can help with that. Junior and teen camp. This is still a ways out, but registration Sunday is two weeks from today. So, if your junior or teen wants to go to camp this summer with our school and church group, then we recommend, if you want the good price, to register on or by that Sunday, March 12th. You get a $30 discount if you do it by that Sunday. And really, it's a $60 discount compared to the final price. There's an early bird price, and then there's an extra discount for doing it through Registration Sunday. If you want more details on that, come see me. I've got information. I've got registration forms, all of that all that you'll need for that. All right. And teen activity, Friday, March 17th. There are little flyers like this. Excuse me. 
little flyers like this out in the foyer on the table as you come in the door. This is an activity for 6th through 12th graders at Roundtable Pizza on Friday, March 17th. See Trav Leonard for more details on that. All right, and last but not least, we have our directory. This may very well be the last time that we send this around. I should say the last Sunday. We may do it tonight as well. Um, check to make sure you like your picture in here before it's preserved for posterity. And check to make sure your information is correct. If we don't have your name in here, you want your name in here, you can add your name, add your address, add your, there's a section in the back for birthdays, anniversaries, add whatever you want your church family to know. Don't add anything you don't want them to know. If you don't want them sending you emails, don't give them your email address. Though there is a section on the front that talks about directory etiquette and that it should be used courteously and so forth. All right, so I'm going to hand that around. And one other note on that, there's some people here who still need their pictures taken. Pastor Brent is not here, but he left the backdrop set up in his office. So after the service, if you need your picture taken, you're not in the directory, or your picture is not in the directory yet, talk with either Efren or myself. We'll snap a photo of you, and we'll get that in there for you. All right. I believe that is all of our announcements, and we'll turn it over to Brother Efren at this time. All right, good morning. Well, you got me again. Jeff is uh, not here today. He's not feeling too well, him and Debbie, so um, keep them in your prayers. It's not, he, he said it wasn't anything really serious, but he wasn't feeling well enough to, to lead music today, so. Um, I was just going to say, turn to your hymn books, but, you know, I'm still, in my mind, I'm still old school. Uh, we have a, a screen over here. I'm looking at one back there, and, and soon, God willing, we'll have a bigger screen back here. So, number 23, Worthy of Worship.
who can stand, please stand. We'll sing the next hymn, number 10, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. standing with me as we read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 11 through 13. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Ephraim, would you lead us in our final song, Bow the Knee. Please remain standing, and at the end of this hymn, uh, we'll dismiss the, the children for junior church. Bow the knee.
thank you, Cheryl. And you may be seated. All right. How many of you come to church for a lesson in cattle ranching? All right. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 21. We will begin in verse 28. Oh, before. Yes, children may be dismissed to Children's Church. Thank you. During the Sunday school hour, Trav, Leonard, and I sometimes have too much fun. Because we don't have any teenagers that come, which is sad, but we are in there waiting for teenagers to show up. And we talk about everything under the sun. And today was no exception. I've been playing with artificial intelligence recently. And Trav and I were having fun, or I was doing it and getting his input. And an AI, artificial intelligence, wrote, wrote this little poem for us this morning. And yes, I did not write this. I gave it some ideas what to write, but I didn't write it. This is a poem for you. Pastor Brent's absence leaves a hole. We miss his sermons, his wives console. But Josiah's words we must condole as we sit through them without a goal. He takes the pulpit with unsure feet and speaks of cattle with tedious beat. A lesson in ranching we cannot meet as we yearn for Pastor Brent's seat. Though not the usual sermon fare, Josiah's teachings we cannot bear, for in these words we find despair as we long for Pastor Brent's care. Though some may try to listen and engage, the rest of us are in a silent rage. As we wish for Pastor Brent's soothing stage and not Josiah's cattle ranching page. <laughs> All right. A lesson in cattle ranching. Exodus chapter 21. You should have had time to find it by now. Exodus 21, beginning in verse 28. If an ox gore a man or a woman that they die, then the ox shall, sure, shall be surely stoned, and his flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner of the ox shall be quit, for shall be innocent. But if the ox were wont to push, in other words, he gored, he was known to gore with his horn in time past, and it hath been testified to his owner, and he hath not kept him in, but that he hath killed a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and his owner also shall be put to death. If there be laid on him a sum of money, then he shall give for the ransom of his life whatsoever is laid upon him. Whether he have gored a son or have gored a daughter, according to this judgment shall it be done unto him. If the ox shall push or gore a manservant or a maidservant, he shall give unto their master thirty shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. All right, let us pray, and then we will get into this very unique portion of Scripture. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these five verses and for the truths, for the principles that they teach us. Help us to go away from here this morning, encouraged, challenged, whatever it is that we might need. We ask it in the name of your precious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It might seem strange to you that we are looking at five verses that give us a lesson in cattle ranching. And specifically in what to do if your ox kills someone. How many of you here this morning have any experience whatsoever in cattle ranching? Okay, that's actually more than I expected. I have no experience whatsoever. But let's get a little closer to home here. How many of you have ever had to worry about an ox killing someone? I don't see any hands raised on that one. 
So how is this going to be relevant for us today? That's my problem. Uh, well, first we must begin understanding the Old Testament law as a unit is not binding on us as New Testament believers, all right? And I don't think there's a lot of debate there on these verses, because I don't think any of you are concerned about your ox killing someone and what to do about it. This is a part of the Mosaic Law called the Book of the Covenant. It covers Exodus chapters 21 through 23. But the entirety of the Old Testament Law, what we have in Exodus, what we have in Leviticus, what we have in Deuteronomy, the entirety of the Old Testament Law was given to the nation of Israel And it's therefore, it's specific. They're a nation. We're not a nation. The church is not a nation. It's specific to their setting, to their special role as a lighthouse to other nations. Yes, we in the New Testament are to be a lighthouse to others, but not as a nation to other nations. So our role is different in what God has us doing. Because of that difference, between Israel and the New Testament church, we cannot just take those Old Testament laws and automatically apply them to our lives. But those commands do still have relevance for us. And what is that relevance? The relevance is this. The God who gave those Old Testament laws, the God of the Old Testament, is the same God that we serve the same God. The sinful human heart that those laws were addressed to is the same sinful heart that you and I have apart from the indwelling spirit of Christ. So we must ask then, when we come to obscure laws like this, what do these laws show us about who God is, about who we are, and about how God wants to change us from who we are to becoming more like him. That is how we should ad- approach a portion of scripture like this. What do these five verses teach us that is as true today as it was for the original recipients of these laws? And this is an important distinction to make. If someone preaches something from a portion that the original recipients of that law or that, who were reading that portion of scripture, if they couldn't get that interpretation from it, probably not the right interpretation. So what is the truth as true today as it was for those original recipients? I'd suggest the following. The Lord holds every one of us accountable for our own actions. The Lord holds every one of us accountable for our own actions, for our own wrongdoings. Our God is impartial in his justice. And here in Exodus chapter 21, verses 28 through 32, we see two arenas. And yes, I chose the word arenas on purpose. Two arenas in which God's impartiality is evident. First arena that we see is the perpetrator's identity. The identity of the one who the Lord holds accountable. The one who has done the wrong. And here is that arena. The Lord holds us accountable regardless of who we are. We'll see this in verses 28 through 30. Let us read those verses again. If an ox gore a man or a woman that they die, then the ox shall surely, shall be surely stoned, and his flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner of the ox shall be quit. But if the ox were wont to push with his horn in time past, and it hath been testified to his owner, and he hath not kept him in, but that he hath killed a man or a woman, The ox shall be stoned, and his owner also shall be put to death. 
If there be laid on him a sum of money, then he shall give for the ransom of his life whatsoever is laid upon him. So in these verses, we see that the Lord holds both the ox and the ox's owner accountable for their own actions, for their individual wrongdoing. The ox is not held responsible for the wrongdoing of its owner, nor is the owner held responsible for the wrongdoing of the ox. Each re is responsible for his own actions. And we have a term that we use to, for that. It is personal responsibility. You are accountable for your own actions. We are only accountable for our own wrongdoing, not for the wrongdoing of someone else. Look with me again at verse 28. If an ox gore a man or a woman that they die, then the ox shall surely be stoned. So we got this general command. If an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox must be put to death. And its meat should not be eaten. So the ox is responsible for its actions. Now, I don't think scripture is saying that an ox has morality, and that an ox thinks about whether it's going to kill somebody and it's, it has hatred in its heart or any of that. It's simply saying an ox killed someone, someone who was created in the image of God, and that ox therefore deserves to die. All right? Even an animal does not get off free if it does wrong, especially this kind of a wrong of killing someone. Justice must be served. But in the second part of the verse, we see the owner of the ox shall be quit, or shall be innocent. The owner of this ox doesn't know that the ox is going to kill someone. He doesn't know that the ox is dangerous. Therefore, he is not held accountable for his ox's actions. But then in verse 29, we see a scenario in which the ox's owner does know that his ox is dangerous. Look at verse 29 with me again. But if the ox were wont to push with his horn in time past. In other words, if it was known that this ox was dangerous and that he had gored people before. And it hath been testified to his owner. The owner has been warned. And he hath not kept him in. But that he hath killed a man or a woman. The ox shall be stoned, same punishment for the ox. The ox shall be stoned, and his owner also shall be put to death. Now the owner of the ox also shares in the accountability, because he knew that the ox was dangerous, and he did nothing about it. He did not prevent this killing of a man or a woman from happening when he could have. He was complicit in the wrongdoing of his ox. And we too are accountable for any wrongdoing with which we are complicit. If we have the opportunity to know about some wrongdoing and the opportunity to stop that wrongdoing, and yet we turn a blind eye to it, we look the other way, we too are accountable for that wrongdoing. Perhaps today, I know that some of you work in the trades. You're a skilled worker, and you're responsible for ensuring that a certain part of a property, or a certain part of a building, is constructed properly. If part of that construction fails, who is held responsible? Might require some kind of an investigation to figure that out. Was it the fault of the construction worker? Perhaps, but perhaps not. Perhaps it was faulty materials from a supplier, right? That could be the case. The supplier would then be responsible for that failure, for any injuries resulting from it. 
But what about this? What if you, as the construction worker, knew that the materials were faulty, and yet you chose to use them anyways? Who's responsible then? Both, right? The company that produced them, they're, they're responsible for producing faulty materials. But the person who knows about it and doesn't say anything is also responsible. You and I are accountable for any wrongdoing with which we are complicit. But then look at verse 30. There's some hope here. Verse 30. If there be laid on him a sum of money, then he shall give for the ransom of his life whatsoever is laid upon him. Legally, this man deserved to die. His ox had killed someone, and he knew that his ox was dangerous, but he hadn't prevented this ox from killing someone. He deserved to die. But God puts a loophole in the law. He says that those who are ex exacting the justice don't have to kill him. They can provide, he, there can be a ransom option, a redemption option, where the man can buy back his life. Now, there's no set price here. And this isn't even an obligation. Because legally, he deserved death. And those exacting the justice, whether that's fam family of the victim, whoever it might be, might say, you deserve to die, you're going to die. But there's the option that they could lay on him, if there be laid on him a sum of money. They could set a price and say, if you pay me this much money, we'll give you your life. And they don't say how much money, because it could be the highest amount of money possible, and it would still not equal the value of a human life. They could set that amount as high or as low as they desired. But this is an opportunity for the family, the friends of the victim to show mercy to this owner of the ox. He shall give for the ransom of his life whatsoever is laid upon him. Now, you should notice that the ox doesn't have this option. The ox doesn't get the option of paying his way out of it. Only humans get that option. Because humans are created in the image of God. Humans have the ability to change. Change their ways. Humans can receive mercy and they can change because of it. So I'm going to draw a parallel here to what the Lord Jesus does for us. It is a similar, and yet such a, so much greater way that the Lord has made, us, has made a way for us to be spared from the death that we deserve. The Bible tells us that all people have sinned, that the consequence of our sin is death. Not just physical death. This, man, this ox's owner deserved physical death. We don't just deserve physical death because of our sin. We deserve eternal separation from God. Separation from him now, while we're here on this earth, and separation from him forever in a place called the Lake of Fire. We are accountable for our sins, for the wrong things that we do. Yet Jesus displayed his mercy to us by dying in our place on the cross of Calvary. Though we are wrongdoers, he extends mercy to us. Though we deserve to die, we have the opportunity to live. 
even in the death of Jesus, God's justice is on display. You look at this passage in Exodus and you could say, is justice actually being served here if the person gets off without giving their life? Well, we could argue that one back and forth. The ox was killed. The man had to pay him some of money. But when Jesus came, justice was fully satisfied. There was a life given in death in place of your life being taken in death. Justice was satisfied. God's justice. He does not let anyone get off free. Your sins must be punished. But the question is, are you going to be punished for your sins? Or are you going to accept that Jesus was punished for your sin? The only difference between what's happening here in Exodus and what happened with Jesus dying on the cross is that Jesus took the punishment in the stead, in the place of the guilty one. God is still impartial in his judgment. He holds us accountable regardless of who we are. So it doesn't matter who you are, the Lord will hold you accountable. But let's consider a second arena of God's impartiality. And that is, the Lord holds us accountable regardless of whom we sin against. Not only of whom we are, but whom we sin against. Not only the perpetrator of the offense, but the victim of the offense. And the first part of this, we've already looked at this, but in verse, four, verse 28, we just went right past it without stopping to talk about it. If an ox gore a man or a woman. Did you notice something in there? If an ox gore a man or a woman. There's, the Lord is teaching us something in this law code. That is that men and women are created equal in their value before God. And we ought to treat men and women as being of equal value. The Lord makes no distinction in these verses between what happens if an ox gores a man or if an ox gores a woman. In both cases, punishment is the same. The ox is to be killed, and if the owner is complicit in the action, he also should be killed. Now this was countercultural in the ancient Near East. In the ancient Near East, men were dominant. I don't think that's a surprise to you. Ancient Near Eastern cultures may perhaps have prescribed that if an ox killed someone and the owner was complicit in it, Perhaps the ox's owner's wife might be killed, but not the ox's owner. Not, not, if, not if a lady was killed by the ox. You would not kill a man for a lady being killed. You might kill his wife, but you wouldn't kill the man. That was ancient Near Eastern culture. And I don't know that there's an exact parallel to this law in their culture, but, but that is the way that they thought. And the same goes when we come to verse 30. Or, excuse me, verse 31. Whether he have gored a son or have gored a daughter, according to this judgment shall it be done unto him. Same thing would happen in the ancient Near Eastern cultures. If your ox killed someone and you knew about it, or excuse me, if your ox killed someone's son or someone's daughter, if it killed a child, and you knew about it, you were complicit in the action, then your son or your daughter might be killed. But you would not be killed. That is the way that the ancient Near East thought. And that is wrong thinking, it's unbiblical thinking, because whether you're a male or a female, whether you're a child or an adult, you are created in the image of God. You have equal value before God.
We come then to verse 32. Verse 32 is a little bit more difficult. If the ox shall push a manservant or a maidservant, he shall give unto their master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. Again, let's talk about what is clear here. A manservant and a maidservant are considered as equals to each other. So gender is not the issue here. Gender is not a determining factor in the person's value. We could have said the same on verse 31, a son or a daughter. But what about the value of slaves in comparison to free people? There's this extra 30 shekels of silver thrown in there that just makes us wonder what's going on. And th that 30 shekels of silver would be approximately the amount a laborer would make in four months in their culture, all right? Four months' wages that is given to the slave's master if he is killed by your ox. But there are two possible ways that we could read this law. One is, this is a set standard. If an ox kills someone's slave, the ox is to be stoned, you give him 30 shekels of silver, and that's it. And there's no consideration of whether the owner was complicit in the action or not, and therefore the, the owner of the ox will not be killed because there's no consideration of it. That's one way of taking this law. I don't think that is the correct way of viewing this law. Because I don't think that under, is a, a good understanding of law in the Old Testament, generally. The law was not intended, like our US laws, to be statutory. In our country, there are specific laws of say what we can do, what we can't do. But if I do something that isn't clearly defined in the laws, then the courts are going to give me some grace. And they're going to say, well, that, the law didn't say he couldn't do that. Well, the Old Testament law wasn't intended to be like that. The Old Testament law was intended that if God gave you a principle, you apply that principle in other situations of life beyond the command he gave you. So, would the principles in verses 28 through 30 also apply in verse 32? I think they would. So I think the 30 shekels of silver is something that is on top of everything else. So if the slave is killed by the ox, you have to give him 30 shekels of silver, your ox has to be stoned, but if the ox's owner was complicit in the action, he also would be killed along with the 30 shekels of silver given to the slave's owner. So if anything, this is greater consequences for the slave, not lesser. That's the way that I read it. And if you have insight into why it should be otherwise, feel free to let me know after the sermon. So then we have to ask, what was the purpose of those 30 shekels of silver? Why were they necessary? And really, that is asking the question of how do we grapple with the reality of slavery in the Bible? Slavery was a sad reality in the biblical world. And the Lord made many laws regarding it to keep masters from oppressing their slaves. There were laws that said if you had a slave, you were supposed to let it, a slave of the Jewish people, you're supposed to let him go after seven years and not hold any obligations against him. There were all sorts of rules to maintain slavery, but nowhere in scripture does God commands slavery. Nowhere does he endorse slavery. 
But I think what we have here is a recognition that slavery existed, as sad as that is. And, and we should also make this point, slavery in the Bible is not racially based. Slavery in the Bible is not necessarily cruel. In some cases, slavery was out of debt. I can't pay my bills, so I am going to put myself in slavery to someone while I bring myself up, get myself out of debt. So it, was not always, it did not always have the bad connotations that we put with slavery. But here, these 30 shekels of silver, I think that it is a recognition. Not only is a human killed, human created in the image of God has been killed. Therefore, life is required, or death is required, of whoever was responsible for that death, whether that's just the ox, whether that is the ox, as well as the owner. But the 30 shekels shows us that there was a master out there that owned that slave who was also being put out by the slave's death. And four months' wages is not a lot to pay someone for the loss of their slave, but it's reasonable. So I think that's what we have going on here. It's not an endorsement of slavery. It's simply a recognition that it exists and how to work with it in that world. Importantly, this giving of 30 shekels does not suggest that a slave was any less of a human than were the free persons in verses 28 through 31. Because as we said, the death of a slave, it seems, actually required more consequences than the death of a free person. And that brings us to our conclusion this morning. We have seen that the Lord holds every one of us accountable for our own actions, or for our own wrongdoings. Regardless of who we are, regardless of whom we sinned against, God will be just, and he will be impartial in his judgment. Perhaps today you are in a position where you need to accept the responsibility that God has given you. You need to take accountability for what the Lord has given you accountability in. Certainly, every one of us is accountable before God to live by what he commands. Perhaps you need to take responsibility for that this morning and understand that you fall short. That you, apart from Jesus Christ, you have no hope of satisfying God's justice. God's justice will be served either in your death, eternal death, or in the death of Jesus Christ in your place. And which are you going to depend on? Are you going to take that justice yourself, or are you going to depend on Jesus to take that punishment for you? But for the believers here this morning, we also need to take accountability, to take responsibility for the, the responsibilities that we have. We need to step up to our responsibilities. If you are a husband and a father, you are accountable for God, to God, for the leadership of your wife and of your family. If you're a leader in a ministry here at Calvary, you are responsible, you are accountable for that ministry. If you have responsibilities in the workplace, you are accountable to do those responsibilities well. You're accountable before God for how you do your work. So believers, my challenge for us this morning is this. Step up the responsibilities that God has given us.
we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and we will be held accountable. Let us close in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these verses from the book of Exodus that remind us of the importance of our responsibility and of our accountability before you. Help us to step up to those responsibilities, to embrace our accountability before you, to live as your servants. We ask all these things in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I believe Brother Bruce is collecting prayer request cards, so if you have one, would you pass it to the center aisle? And Brother Ephraim, would you come lead us in our final song? I will follow. Okay, all of those who are able to stand, if you can please stand. We'll, we'll be singing number 442, I will follow. Several prayer requests have been turned in here. Pray for Brother Chester. He has COVID. And pray for him to recover from that. Pastor Brent and Zach are driving across the country right now. Pray for safety for them. Pray for Barry and Cheryl Webb. I believe they were here maybe two years ago. I know it was before I was here. They have, is it COVID as well? It's bronchitis. Okay. They have bronchitis that they are dealing with, so pray for their healing. And then pray for one of our regular attenders here, Brian Lee. He's in Stanford, admitted, and he needs a kidney transplant. He is very... How should we say it? His, his life is very much at risk right now, so pray for, for Brother Brian. Pray for Anna and Shirley have a friend whose brother Gary is going to have surgery on Tuesday for his heart. Richard Bay Ramon has two praises here. Son Brian and daughter-in-law Rachel are having a baby in September. And... Richard's eye surgery was successful. And then Trav is asking us to pray for increased teenagers to come to the Sunday school. So let us pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can cast our cares on you and know that you care for us. That the things that burden our heart, our hearts, also burden your heart. So we pray for these requests that have been turned in. We pray for Pastor Brent and Zach as they drive across the country. We pray that you give them safety. Bring them back to us in your timing. We pray for a brother, uh, brother Chester. As he has COVID, we pray that you'd strengthen him, bring him back to full health quickly, we ask. We think also of Brother Brian Lee. He is in Stanford right now. 
seeking kidney transplant as soon as possible. And we just ask that you would superintend that situation, that you would provide that kidney transplant for him. And spare his life if it would be your will. We just pray for your will in his life and in his body, for your encouragement and comfort for Brian and for Molly, for their family. We do pray for this evangelist who's been here in the past, Barry Webb and his wife Cheryl. You would strengthen them, help them to recover from this bronchitis that they have. I pray for Anna and Shirley's friend's brother, Gary, who has a sur heart surgery coming up on Tuesday. Pray for your will, again, in his life and in his body, for that surgery to be successful, if it would be your will. We pray for Rich Bay Ramones. Thank you for these two praises that he shared. Thank you for his son, daughter-in-law, who are having a baby in September. We thank you for new life, physical life, and the excitement that that is. We thank you for this successful eye surgery that he had as well. Thank you for the blessings that we get to celebrate as well as the petitions that we bring to you. And I pray for our youth ministry here at Calvary, specifically for the teen Sunday school class, that you would bring the teens in. And we do pray in every part of this ministry, every part, every family here, that you would be doing a great work making molding each of us to be more like your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray these things. Amen. You are dismissed. Again, if you need to have your picture taken, see Ephraim or see me. Amen.